Okay, you thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you are live now. Okay. Well, colleagues, uh, we are here for council meeting of today, April the 28th. I hope everybody can hear me okay. And uh, to begin this meeting, it's the first council meeting we've had since the horrific events of a week ago on uh, Sunday. So uh, I think what we'll do is you can leave your cameras on, maybe turn your uh, audio to mute, and let's just have a moment of virtual silence. Okay, colleagues, thank you. All right, April the 28th. Um, first of all, I'm gonna do what would, maybe you'll hear me okay if I do that, you okay? Um, yes. I'll change back to that if I need it. Getting some noise. Let's just make sure that uh, the whole cast is here. So we'll do what we've done, which is ask people to uh, just to uh, turn on their cameras and their um, microphones when I uh, uh, call your name just to make sure that everything is working. And I want to acknowledge uh, not only with Cheryl here and the assistance of Corey, but Laura and Liam are our producers today. So they're doing it for the first time. And uh, so uh, let's just uh, give them every consideration as they uh, go through this on our behalf and they'll be able to do this for a number of uh, meetings to come. Okay. Uh, Councillor Stretch, are you with us? Uh, yes, I'm here, uh, Mayor. Uh, good to see you all again, albeit uh, virtually, uh, from District 1, Waverly, Fall River, Muscadabit Valley. And uh, things are uh, uh, starting to come around, uh, quite reflective uh, in my mind these days, and uh, looking forward to uh, better days ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll come back to you, Councillor Stretch, in a bit. Thank you. Councillor Hensby, I see you there. President of Canada for, sir, District 2, Preston Chesapeake Eastern Shore. Thank Here you. Awesome. Uh, Councillor Karsten. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, colleagues, and uh, everyone uh, watching us uh, virtually. Uh, certainly, Mr. Mayor, thank you for uh, the moment of silence. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, for many people, this the events of uh, a week and a half ago are still really uh, understood in terms of there's so much of this that's been surreal and uh, I think what keeps us all going is the support uh, that uh, uh, many many people have uh, expressed Mr. Mayor as you know uh, your your colleagues and big city mayors expressed uh, their condolences for all of the province as well and uh, I think it's that kind of support that does keep us going to some degree thank you thank you Councillor Councillor Nickel Councillor Nichols not with us just yet. Councillor uh, Austin, are you with us, Sam? I'm here, Mr. Mayor, uh, President and Accounted for from Dartmouth Centre. All right. All by yourself in the house today, are you, Councillor? <laughs> I'm never all by myself in this house, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Councillor Mancini. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good afternoon, everyone. You know, I would like to, if I, you don't mind, Mr. Mayor, acknowledge once again our amazing healthcare professionals that are on the front line. Uh, I do want to acknowledge uh, uh, Kate Delaney, who's in darkness, not far from where I live, that's been going to Northwood uh, every day uh, working. And at one point in time, she was the only person on the floor taking care of the residents. Now the QE2 hospital has uh, offered support. And now her daughter, who's a third year health science student, Erin Delaney, has joined her in volunteering every day. And so it's amazing, Mr. Mayor, you know, not all heroes wear capes. 
So I just want to acknowledge all those healthcare workers, especially Aaron and Kate Delaney. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Mason, are you with us? I'm here, Mr. Mayor, uh, Wayne Mason, Councilor, District 7, Halifax, South Downtown. Beautiful, sunny, not snowing at all, not slushy out there at all. Uh, and uh, I know uh, uh, a lot of people would like to see some sunny weather, but I guess this will help us all stay the blazes home. Thank you, Count. A lot of people, will they can tell that you're, I can see you sitting on scaffolding out in front of City Hall. Uh, <laughs> and we here. brought in a Zoom boom and I'm, I'm positioned perfectly, blew the, blew the snow off the building. I was going to say the weather looks better than it does outside my window here at City Hall. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Smith, are you with us? I am, Mr. Mayor, and, and hello, colleagues and everybody watching. And to echo uh, Councillor Mancini's word, thank you to all the healthcare workers, and especially thinking of those at Northwood. Uh, many families are, are, are mourning, and, 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 and many families are, are also um, thinking about their loved ones who are working on the on the front lines every day. So, you know, thank you to everyone who's putting uh, their their health at risk to serve those who are in need, from the people cooking uh, to those who are providing the health services that are so important, and also the families who are supporting as well. So, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you to everybody else. Thank you, Councillor, and. Uh... You spend a lot of time, and I do as well, at Northwood. And the, the yes, people that yes. are very special, the people who are resident there, but also the people who go there for programs, and the staff, and the uh, management. Um, and I know it's a very difficult uh, time for everybody there. And we send the best wishes of all of us to the folks, particularly at Northwood. Thank you, Councillor sure. Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Councillor Cleary. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. And like others, I'd like to uh, you know, echo my thanks to all those on the front lines. But I also just want to tip my hat to all residents of Halifax, of Nova Scotia, in fact, around Canada, around the world. I mean, this is a global pandemic and we're all dealing with it in different ways. Um, you know, if you got up this morning and you got a cup of coffee, that wasn't grown here in Canada. So there are folks all around the world still getting us the food that we need, raising the crops. And so I want to tip my hat to vir virtually everyone in the global community who's dealing with this global pandemic. Well done, thank you. Councillor Walker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I'm here in District 10 and uh, snowing outside and uh, starting to mount up. Uh, soon going to have to get the crews out doing the roads and uh, it's not over this yet. Stay safe. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Councillor Adams, I know you're here. I'm here. Yes, uh, Your Worship, and um, I don't like the idea of the snow building up, but uh, we'll deal with it if it does. All right. Are you... Uh, you're not in outer space, are you? <laughs> well, it's. Uh, I look like. I think I look like I've been abducted by aliens. <laughs> I, or by which, you know, it's the only way a, a fella could get out these days, really. <laughs> it's a very quite a background. All right. That explains Excellent. things. Um, Richard Zarowski, are you with us today, sir? I am, Mr. Mayor. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Well, on this fine February day, I'd like to say uh, Groundhog Day has just passed, as we can all see, and I'm expecting spring to start anytime soon. And I am uh, looking forward to seeing our good folks out there shoveling the snow and keeping the roads clear. Spring's just around the corner, so all the best to everyone. All right. And by soon, you don't mean the same time frame that President Trump means when he talks about getting testing done, do you? Uh you hurt me. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Whitman, are you with us? I'm here, Mayor Savage, and uh, hello, colleagues. Uh, I also want to shout out to uh, Northwood, especially uh, 8 Centre, where, uh, where our loved one is, and uh, thanks to all the staff who are heroes and appreciate all the, uh, the dedication. Thank you. Councillor, uh, Deputy Mayor, show hello. yourself. Hi there. Yes, I am. Uh, I am here and uh, just wanted to uh, say, well, first of all, I take full responsibility for the uh, the snow. I had the audacity to put my uh, summer patio furniture out over the weekend. So uh, this one's on me, folks. What does that say? I think you blurred there. What oh, that? oh, there we are. OK, awesome. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, Councillor Russell, how are things in Sackville today? Things are pretty good in Sackville. I think uh, the students and, and the parents are celebrating a day home from school because of snow and not because of the virus. And so I think they're happy for that uh, change of pace. Um, otherwise, things are going well. We have uh, 
people appreciating the trails that we have here, even though they can't use them, and, and a lot of them are, are respecting uh, what the rules are, and I, I really appreciate that. I'm also incredibly saddened by uh, the events that happened last weekend. Um, it brings to mind uh, just how temporary our, our time here is, and if it's your time to go, unfortunately, um, but that's what it is, but my heart bleeds for uh, everybody who went through or knew someone uh, who experienced what happened last weekend. I'm terribly sorry to hear what happened. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Outhit in Bedford. Hi, Mayor, and I want to send best wishes to all staff and to all residents. And like others, I want to thank our health care workers and send out my uh, deepest sympathy and best wishes to those impacted by the events of last weekend. I also want to mention that in Bedford, we also had a devastating uh, home fire uh, to the Reynolds family, who I don't know, but they are very well known and well uh, liked family. And I really want to wish them all the best and thank all the folks in the community and the neighborhood that are stepping up for them. And also, uh, we've got a lot of community cleanups going on out in District 16, all over the place, getting garbage out of the ditches. And, and I really want to thank the people who, while practicing social distancing and other safe practices, are really working to clean up our uh, our community as we do this time of year. So thank you to all them and best wishes to my colleagues. Thank you. Okay, did Councillor Nickel join us? She's not quite there. We are working on... Uh, Councillor Nichols' uh, video. Um, I'm here now, Mr. Okay. Mayor. Great, thank you. I'm going to come to you in just a second. Uh, if I kid, Councillor Nichol, thank you. Uh, colleagues, the, the terrible events that started at uh, Porta Peak last weekend and worked their way uh, through Nova Scotia uh, had a big impact on uh, all of us. And uh, I think we're a pretty fragile province, as we saw on Friday with the number of false alarms. There are a couple of councillors who have a particular um, connection to um, victims of this horrendous crime. And I thought we would just call upon a couple of them right now to say a couple of words. And uh, so Councillor Stretch, I know that you uh, knew one of the folks I saw on your, in fact, I think your Instagram picture made it onto the national news. So Councillor Stretch, do you want to say a couple of words? Uh, yes, I, uh, I'd appreciate that worship, your worship. Thank you very much. And uh, your use of the word fragile is, uh, is very, uh, very poignant. And there was uh, an adage uh, years ago that uh, we used to use, uh, life is fragile, handle with care. And uh, as many of our colleagues uh, have said over the last few minutes, these have been very trying times. We all uh, commend uh, our healthcare workers and uh, uh, the work they're doing to protect us all. Uh, last uh, uh, weekend, uh, Saturday, uh, uh, that whole situation was exacerbated extremely for uh, many, many families and residents throughout uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, the the, the uh, tragedy, uh, the horrendous uh, actions uh, of one person uh, affected so many people. Uh, one of those people was a young man in my community and uh, his name uh, was Joey Weber. Uh, Joey is uh, about a year or two older than my oldest son. I have watched uh, as all the kids over the years grew up and uh, uh, had great respect for him as uh, our family has uh, for generations of his family before. And when I got the uh, the tragic news that uh, he lost his life in this incident as well, it really, uh, really hit home. And I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, Joey. Uh, he and his family are, uh, are residents of Halifax County in the Muscadabit Valley, a small community uh, called uh, Wise's Corner. Uh, they, uh, for the most part, have uh, done agriculture and uh, forestry work. But one of the unique things uh, about Joey and his family was uh, they didn't use the uh, uh, big uh, fancy machines and the or the uh, uh, harvesters, etc. They did things the way that our forefathers uh, and generations before us did. They had a couple of big uh, draft horses. And I remember one day when Merrill and I were driving home, he was uh, just pulling out of, uh, or just coming out of the woods with those big horses uh, with a big load of the logs on behind and came right out onto the main road. And I stopped and took a picture and it warmed my heart to see uh, uh, that type of activity and the respect for uh, the ways things used to be done uh, still being continued by he and his family. Uh, he always had a smile on his face. 
Uh, I would drive by his home uh, regularly on my way to City Hall, coming through the old guys for a road and uh, uh, always waved. I uh, had a good word to say about everybody. And I really want to send out uh, condolences, not only personally, but indeed on behalf of all of us to, uh, to his uh, family, his three daughters, uh, and to uh, his uh, uh, partner. Uh, uh, and uh, the sorrow that they're feeling is uh, shared by all of us. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the first responders, the RCMP and indeed uh, Ground Search and Rescue who came right to uh, uh, action yesterday and that young girl down in uh, Muscadabit Harbour was missing. We are so fortunate to have uh, folks like these uh, looking after us, including the healthcare workers right now. And uh, it's even more so important in times of uh, uh, trouble like we've been experiencing. So uh, uh, the pandemic has been uh, uh, terrible. It's been very hard on a lot of people and a lot of uh, deaths have ensued. And then to have it uh, compounded by a tragedy uh, as we saw in the Port of Peak and throughout the province the last few days is uh, uh, it's heartbreaking. So uh, my thoughts go out and uh, I thank you for uh, allowing me to speak. Thank you very much, Councillor. Um, Councillor Nicol, you as well have a, a strong personal connection to this tragedy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for allowing me to speak. And I'll try to get through this as best as I can. I want to say, I, like Councillor Stretch, that I, I share in the grief of all Nova Scotians, in fact, all of Canada, for what I've come to call and all the victims in Nova Scotia's darkest day, and especially with the many who knew Constable Heidi Stevenson. Heidi, to me. My thoughts and prayers are especially with her husband, Dean, and their children, Connor and Ava. In situations like this, it's only natural to want to do something to show support and ease the pain in some way. I've received many concerns from people. The show and the display down at the Cold Harbor RCMP detachment is unprecedented. I want to acknowledge Don Monk for um, actually donating the sign and uh, I gave the depiction of Heidi with the angels, which is where she is right now. Over the past week, I've been approached by many individuals, as I said, and groups with suggestions for a, a suitable memorial, you know, in Coal Harbor for Constable, Constable Heidi Stevenson, who lived here with her family and was involved in so many activities of community life. She lived just a few streets from me, saw her regularly like many people and her smile has been mentioned many times, but she was larger than life and could would do anything for anybody. And that's how she served as an RCMP officer and how we will always remember her. There's no doubt in my mind that such a memorial is needed for Constable Stevenson. And in time, it will be established but in the meantime, all, all these success suggestions that I'm receiving are being forwarded to a close family friend of the Stevensons who will work with the family and others to determine an appropriate course of action in the future. I thank all who contacted me. And while I know we all want to do something right away, I do ask to be patient. Keep the Stevenson family in your thoughts and prayers while providing them the privacy they so deserve at their time during this grief that we're all sharing. God bless them. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Stretch and Councillor Nicol. Um, let me just say I also had a chance to work with Heidi and know her a little bit and I know her husband well, Dean. And uh, as Councillor Karsten will know, we had a meeting of all the big city mayors on Thursday night and. I had an opportunity to say a word to all the mayors and I said all the things that you're hearing about Constable Stevenson, all the accolades and all the positive tributes, uh, believe me that they're an understatement of what she was and what she meant. So um, all we can do is go on and make sure that we honor the memory of both Joey and uh, also of uh, Constable Heidi Stevenson. Thank you very much, uh, folks. Okay, colleagues. Um, there are no minutes to uh, approve the uh, order of business you will have. Um, is there, uh, Cheryl, is there anything on the order of business for you? Uh, no, Mr. Mayor, we do not have any items to add or delete. Okay, Councillor Whitman, you wanted to um, 
to bring something forward, I think. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Savage. Uh, from the normal blue papers in the back of our package, item number nine and number 10. Number nine is regarding uh, the Kyber building on Barrington and number 10, the public safety strategy for our next uh, agenda of our next meeting. Okay, that's in order. Thank you. We'll thank you. Councillor uh, Stretch, you wanted to, uh, I think, to add an item? I did, uh, Your Worship, and thank you uh, for recognizing me. Uh, in light of everything that uh, we've said, I uh, do have uh, uh, an item I'd like to add to the agenda, and if possible, with uh, uh, your approval and that of councils, I'd like to do it uh, uh, right after uh, 6.2 and before number 7. It'll be very, uh, uh, very quick, but very timely. And if uh, I'll bring it forward at that time. I don't know if folks know um, the nature of it. It's a sort of a tribute to the fallen uh, victims. Of it, 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 it is, uh, Your Worship, and it's consistent uh, with what uh, our neighbors in Colchester County have done for the victims that uh, fell in their jurisdiction. Uh, Councillor Nickel and I have discussed this, and uh, we'd like to bring something forward uh, together that uh, uh, we would hope our council colleagues would uh, would support in the time of need. Okay. If everybody would just open their microphones, I'm just going to look for uh, everybody's authority to add that to the agenda. Is everybody okay with that? Agreed. Yes. 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 Agreed. Agreed. Anybody opposed? That will be uh, added. Uh, thank you. Does somebody want to move the order of business as amended? Councillor Stretch, your mic's open. Would you do that? Uh, yes, uh, Your Worship, I'd move uh, the agenda as uh, amended. Second, Second Whitman. Sir Mason. Seconded by Councillor Whitman. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 We can just Aye. do that that way. Thank you. Uh, there is nothing on the consent uh, agenda. Calls for declaration of conflict of interest. Uh, correspondence, uh, Madam Clerk. We have correspondence, um, Mr. Mayor, for item 7.11, and that correspondence has been distributed to members of council electronically. Thank you. We'll move to petitions. Any petitions uh, from council? Is this where we wanted to add that item? Uh, Cheryl, did you say after 6.2? Yes. Councilor Stretch and Nickel? Yes, that would be fine, Your Worship. Okay, let's move then to that item, which is, uh, uh, let's put that on the floor now. Councilor Stretch and Councilor Nickel. Thank you very much, uh, Your Worship, and uh, thank you, uh, colleagues, for allowing me to uh, uh, to jump the queue on this, but I think you'll understand and, and appreciate. I mentioned uh, in my discussion, as did Councillor Nickel, that so many people have reached out uh, uh, both emotionally uh, in support of uh, all the families that uh, lost loved ones, including the two that we lost here in HRM, uh, Constable Stevenson and uh, Joey Weber. I, uh, I was so impressed with what our colleagues in uh, uh, the small municipality of uh, the County of Colchester did for those that were lost within their jurisdiction. Uh, the, uh, the comment was made earlier that so many people have uh, contributed and yes, there have been uh, GoFundMe uh, and other uh, fundraisers set up. And I know in the case of uh, Joey Weber, uh, his uh, common law wife Shanda and their three little girls are alone now. He was the main breadwinner and the money that was raised, I think it's up to 130,000. Uh, and we all know what it costs to raise children. We know what it costs to uh, put them through uh, school and that money will be used in trust. I want uh, us as a council to uh, consider a donation uh, to help with the burial costs and uh, the final details of both of our residents, Joey Weber and uh, Constable Stevenson. So I would request that the regional council afford us uh, uh, the opportunity to contribute uh, $10,000 total, five to each family to help with the final burial costs uh, and uh, to assist their family. So moved. Councillor Nichols seconds it. Councillor Nichols seconded that. Um, so I'm just going to see Jacques and, and John Traves, are you with us? Yes, Mayor, I'm here. Um, so just want to, in terms of making sure that we do this, um, uh, the correct uh, the correct way we had talked when this came forward just yesterday of whether that originally Councillor Stretch was talking about taking from district capital um, 
Jacques, what is your sense of the best way to do this if it is passed? Well, <clears throat> well certainly our sense would be for it to come out of district capital uh, for me for, for each uh, from each councillor at this point. Um, we uh, there's nothing uh, in the chair that would prevent council from uh, permitting this use of funds. Uh, we're not allowed to provide direct funding to to uh, to businesses, for example, but in this particular case, uh, given the circumstances, I think it's uh, certainly appropriate for council to authorize the disbursement out of, out of district capital funds. Now, district capital from, for the year that we're in has not yet been approved by council, but we could still do it. Yes, okay. we would simply uh, kind of account account for it and understand that that when the budget's passed, uh, the the funds would be uh, uh, journaled to that rules council. Is that okay with both the mover and the seconder? Uh, I'll yield to uh, Councillor Nicol uh, first. Thank you, Councillor Stretch, and uh, I'm supportive of this motion and I am willing to give the district capital, but like the mayor has said, um, the budget for 2020-2021 has not been approved yet and that would be where I would want my district capital funds to come from. So I am in support of that and like I said, everybody's trying to help. This is one way that I can help and Heidi was a, a special friend, but very much aware and very much a supportive of council and all of that we do. So it would be appropriate. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor, yes. Councillor Stretch, did you have? Yeah, it, yes, uh, unless there was any other speakers, I, uh, I'm not sure I, I can close your worship. Okay, there's a couple of folks that want to weigh in. Councillor Adams first. Uh, thank you, worship. I was going to ask if you needed a motion to waive the rules, but I, I guess uh, that's not necessary. I'll look for direction from John or uh, no, no, I think I think we're good, Mayor and, and Council. Uh, we have the unanimous consent to add the item to the agenda. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, anything else, Councillor Adams? I have a question, Mr. Mayor. No, I'm good. I, thank you. Okay, I got Councillor Austin first, and I'll come to Councillor Hensley. Councillor Austin. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I just, uh, you know, on the on the point of district capital, um, I mean, this is something that affected everyone in our municipality in some way. I know there's a lot of people in downtown Dartmouth that were um, particularly upset with the with the clinic being in the community. I, I, Constable Stevenson was my high school liaison officer, and uh, Dean was my grade ten science teacher. Um, so I didn't know them like Councillor Nicola, but I, you know, it does touch your own life. Um, and I, I think this is true across the municipality. So when it comes to district capital um, for Councillor Stretch and Councillor Nicola, um, I'm more than happy to contribute from my district capital fund as well. And I'd encourage all my colleagues to do the same. I think we can all just chip in and we can make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hensley. Uh, thank you much, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I also knew uh, Heidi, uh, knew her as Heidi Burkholder before she got married. But I just want to ask the question that Sam was, Councillor Austin was alluding to. Uh, would that be a contribution from each councillor at $625 per councillor from 16 councillors for the 10000 Are we planning to do it equitably across the board or we're just going to depend on uh, councillors one and four to pay a majority? I just want to know. I'm I'm in I'm in it for the equality, but I wasn't sure what the rest of the council was was feeling on that matter. I think it is now. It would be uh, that it would five thousand would come from Councillor Stretch and five from Councillor Nickel. Um, but we can go any direction the council wishes. Um, Mr. Mayor, Tim here. Can I speak for a moment? Or? I've got uh, Councillor Zorowski first, but I want yes, I, anyway, to. Anyway, we'll come back to Councillor Hensley and, and his his question. Councillor Zorowski? Uh, just uh, that I'd be happy to contribute. I don't see uh, any issue with this at all. So that's just my input. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, is it, I get to, who else was? So is it the wish? If it, if it passes, we have to decide where it's coming from. This could be something that people could just signify that they're prepared to share a part of it. They could let us know and um, it could be divided up that way. 
from councillors that wish to be involved? Is that is that a does that meet that's what the I was test? Of, suggest, Tim. Yeah, is that John? Is that something we can do? I, I think I think uh, the councillors can sort that out uh, with yeah, the two uh, lead councillors, and that would be fine, Mayor. Okay. So we'll just ask councillors to indicate their willingness to be part of that. Councillors, Councillor Walker will share a part. Uh, Councillor uh, Stretch. Your, your Worship, uh, thank you very much, and uh, I, I am I'm touched by the comments that uh, that our colleagues have made. I wasn't going to ask anyone else to contribute. I was going to uh, uh, take this right out of my district capital, and I am prepared to do uh, whatever needs I. Uh, uh, I have, uh, and, and it's not like we're flush with money. Your Worship, the discussions coming later today are going to be very challenging, and some would likely say, uh, is this really the right thing to do? Well, I believe in my heart it is the right thing to do. So uh, I will work with uh, my colleagues if they're so inclined, and one way or the other, we'll come up with uh, the 5,000 for each of the victims, and I'll contribute to whatever I need to to make up the balance from my uh, uh, district capital. So. Uh, uh, if that's uh, if that's agreeable, it it warms my heart, and I thank you all very much. And I call for the question. Okay, seeing no other speakers, we will. Uh, question. Carol, ask you to call the roll. Wholeheartedly for the motion. Councillor Hensby. Absolutely. Councillor Kirsten. Yes. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Mancini. Yes. Councillor Mason. For the motion. Councillor Smith. Support the motion. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walker. Four. Councillor Adams. Four. Councillor Zerowski. Councillor yes. Zerowski. Yes. Sorry. Councilor, it's fine. Councillor Whitman. In favor. Deputy Mayor Blackburn. Absolutely in favor. Yes. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outhit. Yes. And Mayor Sadic. For the motion, so that motion passes. Thank you, Councillor Stretch and Councillor Nickel. Um, and we certainly again wish our best to all the families affected by this tragedy, this crime. Okay, colleagues, we're going to move to um, reports. Item 7.1.1 which is second reading on a respecting animals and responsible pet ownership. Councillor Austin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll read the motion. I move that Halifax Regional Council adopt bylaw A702 amending bylaw A700, the animal bylaw as set out in attachment two of the staff report dated February 5th, 2019. I second, Councillor Nickel. Thank you, go ahead, Councillor Austin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Nickel. Uh, so this is the return of, for me anyway, of the uh, Feeding the Wildlife um, report I asked for. Um, pork chops to raccoons uh, after two years is back. Um, I did have one question for staff. Um, I did get some feedback on this in relation to feeding birds. Um, could, uh, if who's ever on the line from staff, could they clarify? I mean, this is not a ban on backyard bird feeding. I've had that come into my uh, Facebook feed and inbox. Um, is my understanding what this, what the bylaw does by the note about it uh, being prohibited if it's causing a nuisance, is it equips our staff to deal with the most egregious situations. This is not about banning people from feeding the birds entirely. Um, so if we could just clarify that point, how that this would be operationalized, uh, I think that would go away to calming a few nerves about this. Okay, who do we have from staff? Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. It's Andrea McDonald, Program Hi, Manager, Andrew. License Standards. Nice to see you. Thank you. Go ahead. You as well. You're correct, Councillor Austin. Um, it is to deal with the nuisance component. Individuals will still be allowed to uh, feed the birds and the wildlife as long as it does not create a nuisance to their neighbors or other people surrounding them. 
Excellent. So when I when I think about that, that is not the bird feeder where the chickadees are coming in, or it's uh, when someone's um, spreading food in a much more um, indiscriminate ma manner and bringing in large numbers, flocks of pigeons, seagulls, that sort of thing. So the thing that the situation that's really outside the norm. So that's what I'm interpreting that we're really aimed at. <laughs> That's exactly what we're aimed at when it um, is causing excess of food on the ground that's uh, attracting other vermin and other critters as well and large flocks of birds which we have seen as of late as well. Yeah okay uh, thank you for that clarification. Uh, I'm wholly in favor of this. Um, there you know <laughs> it would be nice if common sense was the was the rule of the uh, day but unfortunately uh, when by law we, we get the most extreme situations and right now there's nothing on the books that bylaws can do when they encounter that. So I think this is an important amendment to allow them to deal with those really one-offs where things have gotten into a very uh, messy place. So uh, thank you for your work on that staff. Uh, I support the uh, support the change. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor uh, Whitman. Uh, thank you, Mayor Savage, and uh, thank you, staff. I had the same concern that Councillor Austin had about the uh, the backyard feeders. So I feel somewhat comforted uh, by your response. I've heard from multiple residents as well that are uh, concerned about the feeders. Um, I guess my concern is that the term nuisance is subjective and uh, what one neighbor might consider um, a nuisance uh, in their backyard or in their neighbor's backyard might not be for someone else. So if you could give me a, a heads up on how to be able to uh, determine if it is a nuisance or not. Um, I know from my role on uh, the appeals committee that uh, some stuff that we see in some folks yard uh, isn't deemed uh, as dangerous and unsightly by others and you know it's in the end it's up to staff so how will staff make sure that you know w one bird feeder is okay but but 10 is not um, how will that be um, uh, regulated Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, what we're considering is when there, uh, for example, one example could be if there's excessive defecation, like bird droppings on properties, that's been a uh, complaint that we have received, as well as if it is attracting the vermin and other critters that would cause other issues to the um, environment and to the citizens in that area. So I hope that addresses your query. It does. Thank you. Uh, councillor Russell. Thank you very much. I have uh, received a uh, message from a resident who is interested in housing uh, chickens and he's wondering about a chicken coop and he has been in touch with 311 uh, who has uh, told him that he is still not allowed to have chickens until HRM Council approved it. I'm wondering if the amendments within these bylaw changes at this time would support uh, this resident in Lower Sackville um, to be able to have a chicken coop and supply um, and supply eggs for his house. The current amendment before you does not address that. That, if I'm not mistaken, would be addressed through the land use bylaws. So there's nothing within this bylaw that would take care of that. That is correct. Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor Zorowski. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Andrea, for um, helping us out with this. As always, the devil's in the details, and uh, for some people, they put out food to help the wildlife, and I'm speaking specifically about suburban and some of the more rural areas, especially the deer populations that find themselves trapped in um, urban settings with the rapid development that we've had in District 12 there are many many deer that are trapped in uh, various neighborhoods and are not able to get out and we have a, a lot of folks who are feeding them but they do present a hazard not only um, uh, from their droppings but also from the cars that are driving through the neighborhood and I I've mentioned before that I had the misfortune three years ago of striking a deer on parkland in a foggy evening as it was trying to get across the road and it was impossible not to hit it. It was catastrophic for the deer and didn't do me any any favors either. So I think that 
we have to be careful how we word this um, without causing undue strife for those who mean well. Um, certainly deer populations, they're beautiful to look at. It's wonderful to have in the neighborhood, but the reality is the deer are really animals that belong in the wild. And given the fact that we've got ticks um, all over the region presenting us with the specter of Lyme disease, we need another epidemic to add on top of the current epidemic, like we need a hole in the head. So I'm, I'm really, uh, uh, I really want to see some strict guidelines as to what is considered to be uh, a nuisance, what is considered to be a danger, what is considered to be completely off limits. Um, I, I do understand the difference between feeding a few chickadees in the winter time when the cold snaps happen so that we can protect the birds as much as we can. Crows need suet um, and they tend to be pretty unobtrusive. But when we start feeding the deer, we also get coyotes coming in to prey upon the weakened deer. We also get um, other issues. So if you could comment on that and how you would we would go about structuring something that would be as equitable as possible, especially in light of deer populations uh, presenting us with tick issues along with car issues. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, Chief Councillor, I would see that as more of an education component that we could work with corporate comms to uh, come up with an educational um, sort of platform and have that out for the individual, for the uh, citizens to have available to them. So my understanding is that feeding the deer would not be prohibitive, prohibited? It would be prohibitive if it, if it creates a nuisance based but, on the wording of the bylaw. But the, the issue is it's only a nuisance after the deer gets hit with a car or if uh, people get ticks and their pets get ticks from them. Um, how, this is what I'm talking about, the devil's in the details. By not having, by not feeding the deer, uh, they'll move on to someplace else or can be relocated. But can we not structure this in such a way so that we can actually solve the problem instead of reacting to the problem? I'm not sure if uh, Mr. Trays may be able to address that through a legal perspective. Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, it, it comes down to, you know, the facts of each situation as to whether it's a nuisance or not. If if you are baiting, uh, you know, a deer is wildlife. So if you're baiting wildlife to, to attract it into residential areas, then potentially that will, that will rise to the offense of being a nuisance. Uh, the fact that, uh, you know, um, somebody has fed the deer does not necessarily uh, link it to it crossing the street or or ticks. So it is challenging uh, and it's also, you know, very challenging to enforce uh, the opposite side of the fence, which is essentially one of saying uh, there should be no feeding of wildlife whatsoever. So I think staff has tried to find a middle ground here by imposing a test of a, a nuisance test and that's probably is as good as it can get without trying to um, essentially ban uh, the feeding of wildlife altogether. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm done, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Hensby. Uh, yes, a couple questions in regards to this uh, wildlife feeding stuff. So, Bird feeders are still okay on private property unless it becomes a nuisance and that might be required by a neighbor or so. But in regards to the our description in the bylaw it talks about the feeding of waterfowl adjacent to waterways. So according to this bylaw, are people still allowed to feed the birds in our parks, be it public gardens or Victoria Park with a Robbie Burns statue or 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 uh, or elsewhere and just, and just how I'm reading it is that if, the, if it's by water they're not allowed if they're trying to cut down the amount of feces being excreted along the waterways but but does this prohibit the feeding of wildlife birds in our parks or that are away from waterways my first question and the second question regards to licensing of puppies and stuff what we're doing here now is extending the period that a puppy can be um, 
held by ownership before it gets spayed or neutered because the problem was is that our spayed and neuter program required the, 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 the dog to be done with or registered before it could even be spayed but now we're lengthening that time of window of ownership so therefore they can have the puppy long enough to have it spayed or neutered and then have it registered under the new fee because that's my understanding because we had a, a overlap there so we have that clarification and one technical question now if people want to register their dogs now with our COVID situation how can they do that online because i don't think we have a direct portal of online uh payment we we can you can fill up the application online and you can pay over over the telephone but how do those two things connect how how does that form cross over with the payment receipt so if someone can clarify that point for me uh so relative to the first question with the uh, feeding of the waterfowl that will not be permitted and it's just not on the abutting of the water bodies um, that is across the board so that will not be permitted uh, relative to the licensing of the puppies um, the intent was that we always had a gap that somebody would get a dog at eight weeks not be allowed to have it spayed or neutered until approximately six months at a time six months at that time and therefore they would be required to license at the full unspayed or unneutered um, fee so this was to compensate for that gap in our licensing so we would be able to give them an option and our option that we decided on was the exemption that they would not be required at that time to have it licensed and the good thing is we don't come across too many dogs that are under the age of six months as far as running at large or in violation people are seen to be more responsible with the younger dogs um, and regarding the payments for licenses so some vets are still accepting vet license payments currently even though they aren't fully operational and then we are also looking at alternatives through finance that we can accept um, payments via other forms that we would normally accept at this time so we're working on developing a email so people can email us their applications and then in turn we can process the payment whether it's through credit card or other forms is what we're trying to do at this point in time with COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Ready for the question colleagues? Let's call the question. roll. Question. Councillor Stretch. For the motion. Councillor Hensby. In favor. Councillor Karsten. For the motion. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Manzini. Yes. Councillor Mason. For the motion. Councillor Smith. Support the motion. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walker. For. Councillor Adams. Adams. For. Councillor Zorowski. For. Councillor Whitman. In favor. Deputy Mayor Blackburn. I vote yes. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outhit. Yes. Mayor Savage. For the motion. There are no negatives. I declare that motion passed, Cheryl. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Austin. We'll move to uh, 7.2.1, Councillor Hensby. Muscadabit Harbor and Area Chamber of Commerce. Thank you much, Mr. Mayor. I'll put the motion on the floor that Health Acts Regional Council request a staff report to amend Administrative Order 2019-005 ADM, the Community Area Rates Administrative Order by adding section 33a under section 33 and before section 34 as follows but notwithstanding the purposes of section 33 and 34 this administrative order for the 2021 uh, fiscal year grants may be provided by the community organizations for Muscadabra Harbor without contribution agreement or approval of council if a the cumulative amounts of the grants did not exceed five thousand dollars and b the recipient of each grant is either a not-for-profit organization registered registered joint stocks companies or a registered Canadian charitable organization. 
Second stretch. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councillor and, and colleagues. Uh, this is a request to the municipal of the uh, local chamber of commerce. They want to help with their own uh, COVID uh, response to the community, trying to support local uh, the local economy and also helping those in need. So they want to came up with these uh, chamber bucks and they want to provide basically mo monetary coupons that will be used by the food bank. Uh, the food bank is operated by the Muscadabra Harbor Lions. So these chamber dollars will be going to recipients of the food bank and they can use this as money to go buy uh, additional food in the communities from the various restaurants and the businesses in the Muscadabra Harbor catchment area. So that's what this initiative is, is to help along small businesses during this particular time, but also help those in need. And I hope for everyone's support in this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I see no questions submitted. Is there anybody that has a question? Comment? If not, oh, ready for the question. Ready, ready for the question. question. microphone on uh, sure councillor stretch for the motion councillor hensby absolutely councillor karsten for the motion councillor nickel yes councillor austin in favor councillor mancini yes Councillor Mason. For the motion. Councillor Smith. Yes. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walker. For. Councillor Adams. For. Councillor Zorowski. For. Councillor Whitman. In favor. Deputy Mayor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Out. Yes. And Mayor Savage. Yes, for the motion. That's motion. unanimous. Motion passes. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. We will move to uh, item 7.2.2, Councillor Mason, Lower Water Street Sidewalk Improvements. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council request a staff report regarding costs and opportunities for bringing the sidewalk on Lower Water Street west side between Prince and Sackville to current standards for accessibility. I so move. Second. Second. Whitman. Second. I heard Councillor Cleary with a second. Go ahead, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I think I already spoke to this adequately last uh, council meeting. Uh, this was the work on the other side of the street around Mitchell House and heading down toward the uh, the uh, former Mother Tucker's, now the uh, Halifax Rum space uh, uh, that uh, uh, we, we're now able to look at widening that sidewalk because of the changes that happened in front of Queen's Mark. So uh, I asked for council's support for a staff report around uh, removing the light standard that blocks that sidewalk and replacing the 40 year old failing uh, brick. And I would say to staff, uh, I don't see this having necessarily to be a standalone staff report. The timing of this six months from now would have it coming back during next year's capital budget anyway. So it could just be in TBW's report, but I would ask for a council support for this so that we can uh, make sure that that is addressed there. It's been a request to the businesses in the area. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Anybody else? No other questions? Yes, I do, sir. Question, Councillor Hensby? Just to uh, clarify, if you can, uh, Councillor Mason, is this the section across the street from the new Queen's Mark? Because there's also another section that's very close where the old Maritime Life Museum is and you have a corner of the building virtually almost to the street and it's a very narrow spot. So are you looking at trying to get rid of some of those elevated flower beds in those areas of one protective block and then trying to widen the sidewalk with less barriers? Or are we looking at maybe cutting into a historic building to maybe make access or with a wide enough sidewalk where you have those metal poles and a chain now that you could very, a very narrow spot for anybody to walk? Well, so uh, thank you, if I may, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so the uh, 
Um, the part you're talking about has already been replaced. It's on the, that's the east side in front of uh, the Robertson Building at the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic. And that was improved by the Queen's Mark developer as a part of the package we approved last week. This is on the other side running from Prince to Sackville. So not in front of the federal building, the uh, Dominion Public Building, but running south of that from uh, Strange Adventures uh, down toward uh, uh, Summit Place uh, and, uh, and that corner there. Uh, so uh, while I would like to see the curb, the changes we approved last week would allow the curb to be pushed up probably a, a meter without affecting the lane width of the one remaining northbound lane. Uh, and then once you get about 10, 20 meters south of that intersection, I don't think you need to change anything at all. What's happened in most of the rest of downtown is they've left the planters, but they've taken out the brick and put but, uh, brushed white concrete and a little bit of brick along the edge on the capital district uh, brick pattern. So I, I don't see a super expensive, massive change to the street just at that corner where the light standard blocks the sidewalk. That's been problematic for decades and it would be great to see that fixed. And now we have a chance to do that. Thank you, Mr. Thanks for clarification and, and description. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Ready for the question, Cheryl? Sure. Yes. Councillor Stretch. In support of the motion. Councillor Hensby. In favor. Councillor Karsten. Also in favor. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Mancini. Yes. Councillor Mason. Yes. Councillor Smith. Councillor Smith. Well, my computer froze. I don't, I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, support the motion. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walker. Four. Councillor Adams. Four. Councillor Sarowski. For the motion. Councillor Whitman. In favor. Deputy Mayor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outhit. Yes. And Mayor Savage. For the motion. So that's unanimous. That carries. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Uh, we'll go to 7.2.3, colleagues. <laughs> Councillor Cleary. Temporary installation of tactical bike lanes on active transportation routes. Councillor Cleary. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. So. Um, I'll move that Halifax Regional Council request an expedited staff report on providing safe mobility through an inexpensive, tactical, and temporary installation of bike lanes and active transportation routes along, along the lines of the already approved minimum grid network in the integrated mobility plan or nearby easily implemented streets. Second, Councillor Mason. So thank you, Councillor, and thank you, uh, colleagues. So, um, and I was uh, heartened to uh, read the email from our CAO that uh, this is something that uh, they're already looking at putting together a team to uh, to look at as uh, the uh, you know COVID restrictions begin to be phased uh, in uh, or lessened over the next period of time, and we're we're going to be physically distancing from each other and we're going to be living in this uh, new world for months to come. So the idea that we need to provide where uh, necessary some extra space for pedestrians and, and cyclists, especially given that many of our streets have much less traffic now than they did. And so one of the questions uh, that was put to me was, well, if the streets are, are empty, why bother? Well, we don't want to make scoff laws of our citizens. So in fact, the Motor Vehicle Act says if there's a sidewalk and you step into the road, you're breaking the law. And um, I have personally experienced this walking down Quimpool Road uh, where, you know, there, there could be a number of people walking back and forth to the grocery store. And I've had to step in the street uh, to, to go around people. And at that moment, I just broke the law. So one of the things that's really important is um, we provide safe mobility options for people. Uh, not only from the, the dangers of the road, but now the dangers of, of COVID-19. So I'm hoping that councillors will support this. Uh, my idea is uh, because it's inexpensive, it's tactical and it's temporary, we're not looking at spending a lot of money here. This is, you know, whatever we've got laying around or if we need to buy a few uh, sawhorses from, uh, from woodworkers, 
you know, we can get sawhorses, jersey barriers, stripes, bollards, uh, whatever's around to uh, stick up some temporary uh, walking paths or bike, ra bike lanes uh, where necessary uh, to give people the comfort and the safety uh, that they need. So thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you. I've got Councillor uh, Adams who submitted first, uh, and then we'll go to some other questions. Councillor Adams. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Your Worship. I'd just like to uh, ask the CAO if I could, um, just a couple questions. One, um, expedited would mean in our terms now, what would that be? Um, the uh, timing to complete, um, you know, the, 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 not only the project, uh, but the report as well. Um, our budget is in what would you consider a, a state of flux at the very best. Um, what would it cost uh, or ballpark and, and what would it compare uh, between doing this on a temporary basis versus doing it on a permanent basis? And it, and it is, it, I know Council Clary wouldn't put something in that's not going to be safe, but temporary sounds as if it's a, uh, a halfway attempt at doing something as opposed to doing it permanent, which would be um, would be um, uh, on a permanent side. And this still flies in the face of, uh, you know, we want people to stay home and they're on the bicycles or walking. Um, you know, I guess even in a car would be safer as opposed to, to being out in the air. So I know there's a bunch of questions there, Mr. Dubé, but if you could answer those, that would uh, that would help. Thank you. CAO. Jacques, you there? Sorry, Mr. Mayor, I was on mute. Seems to be a commonly used term these days. Um, thanks for the qu those questions. I did catch the first question, which was, you know, what's the timing of a report? If council so wish to have one, and uh, but I didn't catch the other questions. Sorry. Okay, that's, that's right. I can I can go over them. So the timing of the report, um, our budget is in a state of flux at the best of, I guess that'd be the best description right now. Uh, how would this be accommodated? Um, the timing to complete not only the report but the uh, the work, if indeed we. We uh, agreed with this, and from a from a you know, construction perspective, how does temporary look as compared to um, permanent? And would temporary be any less safe? And I'm just wondering if this may be premature, given that we don't know where this is going, we don't know what the curve looks like, we don't know what's going to happen uh, in the next couple of days, let alone if we're going to get a second wave in the, later in the summer, early fall. So. I don't know if that's a little more clear for a question perspective. Yeah, 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 thank, thank you. Sure. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Um, in terms of the timing of a report to come back on something like this, uh, you know, we're looking at several months, uh, clearly. Um, I would say closer to the end of the year, uh, even all the other work that's going on right now. Uh, I do want to reinforce the message I sent to council earlier today, which is that we are continue to, to um, we are continuing to monitor all actions across the country and in North America and parts of the world uh, and are prepared to adapt to the reopening of the economy in line with the revised provincial direction whenever that is issued. Um, as far as the budget goes uh, and the budget is really tied, the budget would be tied to whether you do a temporary or a permanent fix. Now, as you know, we have uh, we have received some significant funding from the federal and provincial governments around the AAA bike network, and we're well into the we're well into the planning for implementation of that. Um, there's likely about as much work to be done to implement a t permanent um, or temporary measure than there is than 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 a or as a temporary uh, temporary versus permanent. It's about the same amount of work and around the same amount of time. You know, if you put in temporary measures, you still have to realize that there are crosswalks, there are driveways, there are, you know, you have to come up with a plan. You'd have to go out and, and uh, measure off and, and, and all that. So, you know, we're hoping uh, that, you know, as we move forward through the planning around the permanent uh, uh, infrastructure, that we can, you know, certainly 
address all of the concerns uh, that everyone has had around bike lanes and access and those kinds of things. Um, the budget is an unknown factor right now. As you know, we are working towards a uh, recast budget um, and uh, Transportation Public Works and uh, Planning and Development are looking at all those projects and trying to figure out how to get them all done uh, per Council's direction. So, you know, this would be a temporary measure would take a lot of resources, both budget and staff. And uh, uh, so I think it's I think it's a little premature to try to go with a temporary measure now. Um, and I recognize we're all we're looking for here is a staff report, but it'll take us a number of months. And uh, frankly, I think we're we're going to be starting to roll out some of our some of our uh, measures in any case. In the meantime, you know, we are uh, right now planning and development are actually collaborating and establish a joint team to focus on whatever temporary network adaptation may be required to reopen the economy while maintaining uh, necessary health protocols, for example. Um, I think it's uh, once we have a sense of the provincial reopening plan, we can then begin to assemble a plan of temporary actions that anticipates how our local economy will adapt to its use of transportation networks. Uh, and um, you know, I can say that there there may be an issue with social distancing on streets that have pedestrian volumes, with, and, and which may require parking restrictions, lane restrictions, pop-up sidewalks, etc. So you know, we already have been. Um, uh, begun reducing traffic signal cycle lengths of some key corridors uh, where remote access technology exists to optimize pedestrian and track traffic flow. Further, we've identified, we started identifying streets that may be impacted along with potential solutions. Um, and of course, that supports the social distancing rules uh, uh, because it reduces the time that groups or pedestrians can form while, um, while waiting to cross. It's also important to understand that staff response are limited until the restrictions are loosened and the actual problem areas begin to emerge. Um, you know, at some point, uh, you know, when the economy opens up, um, you know, there only there will be certain sectors opening first, right? So we actually believe that there will be uh, a fair amount of cars hitting the road before pedestrians hit the road because uh, people will be looking to get to work, likely wanting to continue some form of self isolation within their own vehicles. So we have to really we have to think through this. Um, you know, we are we're also. You know, our um, uh, put it this way as we look as we. As we look at economic recovery in HRM, it's 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 also. It's also dependent on council's approved capital plan, which is why I mentioned the fact that. Um, you know, we do have the AAA bike network. We're trying to move those pro uh, those projects forward. We're trying to move the um, the the the, uh, the bicycle path uh, across the bridge and the and the and the, and the or the new infrastructure that would, would come down onto Barrington Street. So we're we're fortunate to be amongst the many city uh, amongst the cities who did not cease construction activity, and we've adapted to. Uh, fairly highly modified working environment and I've been able to keep tendering work and issuing permits as levels as levels post the previous year. So you know, I think it's it's important to strike a balance between assigning resources to implement temporary transportation measures versus keeping work flowing to the private sector to implement council's plan permanent capital improvements. So I know that's a bit of a long winded answer, but um, you know I think um, we need to Think about the time uh, it'll take. Uh, it'll take quite a long time to get a report back to you on, on this. Uh, it would take a lot of time to implement, probably as much time as it would a permanent uh, scenario. Uh, and we got to keep the uh, the work uh, going on our on our typical capital projects. I can tell you that uh, you know Brad English and his team are, have been putting putting out tenders, and uh, I've been giving out some awards recently. You know, I think we have 87, six out of 87 road projects already in the hopper, ready to go. We're trying to keep the economy going and the construction industry. And I think that's uh, that's really been our focus lately. So trying to get all our projects going, including including facilities and such matters. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Councilor Mr. Mayor. And uh, I also will support the uh, report, although. How fast it comes is another thing, but at the same time, I I have to wonder. 
the more of this we do, how much we are encouraging people not to stay home and to be out around. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Councillor Walker. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I, I I hear what Councillor Adams and Councillor Walker are saying, but I think this is more about moving out of crisis management mode and planning for the next phase of COVID, which is going to be living with the virus uh, when we're still now going back to work and going back to school. You look at the phase in plan that they have uh, both in a, that they're discussing uh, theoretically in New Brunswick or uh, in Ontario theoretically and actually acting on in New Brunswick. Uh, you're not you're not looking at society being back to normal until the vaccine comes, but you are looking at people potentially going back to work. So, you know, I'm, it's great to hear. It's, it's very gratifying to hear what uh, the CAO has to say about uh, the working group on temporary measures uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, but I feel like this, this motion is still well placed because what we're seeing in other jurisdictions is an increase in foot traffic and bicycle use because people don't want to carpool and people don't want to take the bus uh, until uh, we're farther down this crisis path. And so we've seen that those, uh, that those other modes, those, those modes of uh, getting to work and, and getting to the grocery store and getting around have gone up. And, and that's why other jurisdictions have increased allocation of sidewalk space and and for for bikes. So I see this motion kind of as the worst case scenario. I see this as we haven't really gotten to a place where any of these other things have happened and and council and the public still have questions. But I think this this uh, report could be made uh, redundant by uh, a, a clearer implementation path for what the CAO talked about, that we're going to get to a place uh, sometime in the next month where uh, we have a set of principles about when there's overcrowding at bus stops in downtown and people are going back to work, how we're going to widen the sidewalks there because we're going to have to to meet the social distancing rules. And, and that's what we're seeing in other cities. And if we had that communication coupled with communication about what Brad's group thinks they can bring forward next year for the minimum grid on top of the amazing work that's going to happen this year on North Street and Lehman and the Hall Street bike lane being made protected, which started on today. They actually started that today, 1.1 kilometers right there. So there's a lot of stuff that's going to happen, but if that is being articulated to council and especially to the public who are, have a lot of concerns, and then we see how the minimum grid is going to be built out and uh, biking is going to be supported in the next capital budget. That may make this report completely redundant, but but at this point, uh, uh, I, I don't see how I can't vote for something that is going to be relieving the pressure that's going to be caused by this. And I'll just close by saying uh, the pressure that will be caused by reopening downtown and reopening where, where people work. But I'll close by saying to me, this also does inform the budget. We're going to have hard decisions to make, but we've got to make sure that the capacity capacity is still there to be able to plan and respond to uh, these kind of transportation issues that are going to keep coming up for the next 18 to 24 months while we continue to have this weight in our society but but are far more open than we are now but are not back to normal. So uh, I think it's good for us to be thinking about that as we head into the budget discussion and discuss exactly how we're going to deal with these shortfalls uh, in the when we get the recast budget in May. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor uh, Whitman. Uh, thank you, Mayor Savage, and uh, thank you, colleagues. Um, I agree. I think that this motion is a worst case scenario and it is redundant, unfortunately. Um, I think it's uh, looking for a problem um, that this solution might fix, and uh, I don't see that uh, in this uh, particular case. This isn't a, a solution to a problem. Um, Lots of red flags for me, expedited, meaning that this uh, staff report jumps ahead of many more uh, important and valuable staff reports that we're already waiting for. It butts in line. Um, inexpensive, uh, that's a red flag for me. I don't know of anything that's inexpensive, especially when it comes to uh, bike lanes. And then temporary. Um, boy, from what I've heard from the explanation, I'm not sure if this is temporary or permanent, but either way, I don't, uh, I won't support a temporary measure. Um, I do support uh, good quality bike lanes that are built in the right place and at the right price, and uh, I don't see that here. So I won't be uh, I won't be supporting it. Uh, these bike lanes 
uh, with the 1% uh, usage ahead of time definitely are not a priority now and will not be a priority in the uh, the comeback of uh, our economy. So sorry to uh, to Councillor Cleary up there and uh, Councillor um, Councillor Mason. All the best, but I can't support this. Thank you, Councillor Zorowski. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, thank you, Councillor, for bringing this uh, forward, Councillor Cleary. You know, when I think about this, so many of the issues that we have regarding transportation are because of missed opportunities. And I think, uh, as Councillor Cleary has pointed out, this affords us a wonderful chance to do a temporary measure to see what the opportunities might be in the future. And if we look at other cities, we see that they are making wonderful inroads in bicycle transportation. And we have a lot of residents who will be changing the way they've done things permanently because of the COVID virus. And as Councillor Mason pointed out, this is not gonna be over for a long time. And of course, that means distancing. And this, this affords us with a perfect opportunity to be able to see um, how this might work. Is it a perfect solution? No. And as a wise man once said in council, never let perfect be the enemy of good. And um, I think this is one of those cases uh, where this is a good solution. Everything costs a little bit of money and to use the rubric of money to shut down everything because we're in financial straits means that we will be doing nothing and we will be missing opportunities. COVID will be over. It will change things inexorably in ways that we can't imagine, but it will be over. And I'd like us to be prepared for that. Um, we've also got climate change to consider. We've got a report coming down in May about Halifax 2050, and I think bicycles will play a huge role in this. So why not get the jump on this and start planning for something? So many people are now out and about. It seems as though if you beg them to go out, they all stay at home and play video games. And uh, when you tell them not to go out, uh, everybody winds up going out on the streets and going into the parks. I've never seen so many people cycling, enjoying the outside in a healthy way. And this can be done in a healthy way. So Councillor Cleary, thank you for bringing this ahead. I look forward to us taking the opportunities. And I see this as an enormous opportunity to investigate how uh, bicycle traffic can be integrated more completely with all the other forms of transit that we have here in HRM. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Austin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I, I'll be supporting this motion. Uh, I did, uh, you know, I do hear the staff concern about resources right now. I mean, goodness knows we, we do know we are stretched um, and that's not likely to get any easier coming uh, into our budget deliberations. But I, I did want to note, um, you know, th there are a couple challenges that are unique to us. And the main one is actually our approach right now in the crisis moment of what we're doing with what our province has done with parks. Um, there's really everywhere else in the country, you can still walk through a park. You just can't go to the playground. You can't go to the field like they, we are rather unique and one of the only places that's closed them entirely. And so a lot of the other cities, when they've closed streets, they've closed streets that actually run through or border park space to add on to that green space that's that's being uh, stressed by a lot of people using it. Um, that doesn't exist for us because to close something like, a, you know, when I think of an equivalent street, I guess the Cogswell cutting across the common, um, it, it doesn't have the same impact here. It doesn't make the same sense because the green space that's next to it is closed, whereas in that, that same sort of situation in Calgary, that green space is open. So, you know, there are some real challenges in dealing with this right now in a crisis in the way that other cities have, because most of these streets, that's been the sort of places that have shut down. Um, and so I think Councillor Mason's right. This is more about the recovery phase. Like when I think about, um, well, like Spring Garden Road, for example, if people are back at work in their offices, if people are back in stores, but we're still supposed to be social distancing, we haven't got our streetscaping, you know, done yet type of thing. You know, that's a street that could be really stressed. So there are streets in our downtown in the urban core in particular, where there's a lot of pedestrians where I think we will have to be nimble about this. The focus for us, as long as our green spaces is closed, can't be about creating new public spaces. It has to be about that 
helping people get around by bike and by foot as good as as well as they can. And I'm encouraged that the CAO's comment about that that is on the radar, closing uh, parking lanes, you know, do the temporary sidewalk extensions, that that's at least in the offer. Less encouraged by the comment that this is going to be months coming back in terms of emotion. Um, there are, I did want to draw attention to one of the things that's in the NACTO toolkit as terms of city responses on um, the, the push buttons at lights. I mean, we, st we still have a report that's outstanding on, on that one that, uh, you know, that shouldn't necessarily be new work because Councillor Mason made a request of that at Transportation Standing Committee uh, many months ago. I mean, it was my understanding that was due back to us imminently. So that should, in theory, the work on that should be well advanced and that, should, that might be something that we could actually uh, do here. Um, so I'd like to ask about that, the big button report. Do we have any status on that? If Brad's on the line or if, if Jacques, if he knows? Do we have somebody online who can help us with that? <coughs> Probably not. This yes, is sorry, a, sorry, Mr. Mayor, I couldn't, I didn't catch the question that you, um, mm -hmm. Councillor Austin faded out on me there. Sorry, sorry, uh, Mr. CEO. The, uh, my question is, we had a transportation standing committee, we requested a report on um, changing out the push buttons in the urban core where the pedestrian volumes are the highest. There was a report on that. My understanding it was due back uh, basically now, but of course everything's been disrupted. So one of the recommendations from NACTO is that you stop requiring the push buttons because that's a common surface people are touching. We should already have that work well advanced. So that's something like that shouldn't be requiring a whole lot of new resources because your team was already working on it. I'm just wondering if we have an update on that. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, I don't have an update on that right now, but I can certainly get one for you. Okay, I, well, I, I, can, I, I will say that I was speaking with uh, Brad Anguish earlier, uh, sober lunchtime actually, and. Uh, about, uh, about this issue and uh, you know it's clear to me that uh, given all the work that's out, that's that's in the hopper now um, that uh, the report uh, including that one will be will be a lot of part of this year. Okay well I, I think we'll probably have to have some more conversations about about that that piece in particular. Um, I, I'll just conclude um, I won't come back uh, around again. Uh, I think to some extent, I'm, uh, part of the reason to support this report, even though it seems like it's going nowhere from what the description is, um, part of the reason to support it is uh, the thing that we haven't done a good job on this issue is on the communications front. Um, our, you know, all of us in the urban core have been getting bombarded by uh, notes from residents who are concerned about this, and there really has been no real communication from HRM on this. If we indicated things like such as what you were referring, Mr. CEO, about the that we are looking at doing sidewalk extensions as we get out of this crisis phase and into the living with COVID-19 before we get to hopefully a vaccine, um, that might go a long ways because it's just been radio silence and I think that's been part of our problem. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, through you to Councillor. Uh, look, I agree that we can do a better job on communication here. On, on, the variety, on the variety of things that we're doing in related to COVID-19. I will also point out that this is a moving target, right? So we have a plan to address everything you're talking about uh, going forward. Dr. Strang has told people to stay home. Uh, Dr. Strang has, has asked people to not, to be, not, to, not to wander too far out from, from their residences and those kinds of things. So, you know, we are, we are going to adjust our service levels and our and our approaches to things as we learn more and as we get in further direction from Dr. Strang. I'm not saying we're not going to do any of these things. We're certainly going to be proceeding on, on many of those fronts, but I, you know, on, in terms of timing, um, we're not there yet. And uh, but as, as, the, as the economy gets reopened, as the rules change, we will certainly adapt and adjust going forward. You know, I will make the point on the bike lanes and, and such matters. We, uh, you know, we're in the throes of implementing a AAA bike network on a permanent basis. You know, to, to stop that work and, and start putting in uh, temporary measures at this time is um, when we have a shortage of financial resources and people, um, it's very challenging, right? So I would certainly urge Council to think about that as we go forward. Thank you. Councillor Outhead. 
thank you, Mayor. And uh, when I listened to Jacques uh, speak, and when I listened to, and I, when I read the the document that he provided uh, to us beforehand, it makes a lot of sense. I take no exception to to anything I've said there. But I think we're almost talking apples and oranges. We're talking long term, uh, come out. Uh, re-emerge, reopen, etc. And I think that that planning that he's describing absolutely has to be done. We have to be conscious of uh, conscious of cost. We have to be conscious of what uh, what staff are, the many directions staff are being pulled. Absolutely agree with that. But then I listen to to Wei and to Sam, and I say, okay, what they're looking for here is something short term, immediate, inexpensive. We know at some point Dr. Strang is going to reopen. He's not going to give us six months or six weeks notice what he is going to do. He's going to say as of next week or the week after next or whatever, these offices, these businesses will be opening. And I'm a little bit more concerned about uh, the, the sidewalks, quite frankly, than I am about the bike lanes. I think people can still bike downtown from just about anywhere on the peninsula without encountering a whole lot of cycling traffic, although we might see their cycling and traffic increase. I am more concerned about the sidewalk traffic than I can think of Quinn Pool, I can think of Quinn Garden, I can think of Barrington, etc. And I also see, even in the Globe and Mail today here, and uh, today, year, yesterday, that Toronto's doing this on their busy side of the time and uh, make uh, to allow the business. We know businesses are going to reopen. We know social distancing isn't going to go away on a certain time of day. I don't quite understand why to add some pylons or sawhorses or whatever Sean said to widen little bike lanes, for, but to just allow people to walk safely, safely in the few congested sidewalks we have. This isn't Trump. This isn't Bank. I've lived there. I've walked on. I've traveled to New York, Paris, and London. I know what busy sidewalks are. But we have a few areas. And I don't understand why we need a six month stop to do some temporary widening, blue blocks of side in a few of our contested sidewalks. So I, I'm missing that part. I get the overall vision, Jacques, and, and you're you wanting to be uh, to do this properly and cost effectively. Absolutely get that. But I am missing this few blocks that every other city's been able to do without waiting for six months staff reports, Toronto, Calgary, Edmonton, you know, whatever. There's got to be some sort of conference. Mr. Mayor, through, through you, if I may, to the councillor. Uh, look, first of all, I apologize if I'm not misleading you or I'm not making my point clear enough. Um, number one, um, we are going to adjust to the orders of Dr. Strang, and we are going to, we're going to have to take some special measures, call them temporary measures or whatever that is, to, uh, to accommodate and adjust to that as we go forward. Uh, those municipalities who have jumped ahead and, and have put in temporary measures are now regretting that across the country, um, you know, because you know it's, it's, it's not working for them. We are going to, you know, we're learning from all of our colleagues across the country. We are going to take some temporary measures. The sidewalk issue is, is going to be an issue as as the economy opens up and and recognize that the economy will not open up with a light switch. There will be certain sectors that will be allowed to come back to work and will be phased in gradually. We're seeing that in New Brunswick at the moment, where they're starting to start to starting to take some measures to reopen the economy. Um, so the sidewalks are, are, are likely not going to be overnight filled with people, right? There'll only be certain allow certain businesses that are allowed to reopen, uh, and they won't necessarily all be downtown. But we'll monitor it, and we'll 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 be consulting with Dr. Strang. We'll be consulting with other folks and doing some modeling and and, and coming up with some measures. Uh, you know that we'll actually just implement as we as we move forward, uh, and it doesn't. Uh, you know that won't need a staff report. It will simply be measures that we'll take uh, from an operational perspective to to actually implement these things, right? And uh, and we'll monitor the situation on bike lanes and, and bike usage as well. You know, right now uh, I think bikes are are quite important to people because it's the only form of recreating that they have, right? Uh, they're no longer just no gym time. There's uh, none of that. Uh, so people are using their bikes uh, to the extent that that will continue as the economy reopens. We don't know, uh, but uh, we'll we'll have to measure that and uh, monitor that and take whatever appropriate action uh, you know that our, our transportation engineers feel is, is appropriate, while also protecting the population from uh, through social distancing. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank thank you, Jacques. And that that provides me with some comfort. I don't know how we 
blend that into this motion. There must be something between. I'm getting the time out there from uh, from Mike there, but uh, so we'll we'll see what others say about this. But I I think what you've said in the last couple of minutes provides me great comfort in that there's sort of a middle ground here, and maybe others can continue that. So I'm cut off. Thank you. Thank you. I've got Councillor uh, Russell next. Thank you very much. I was originally looking at this and and uh, being concerned about a number of aspects of it. Uh, at this point, we don't know what our uh, budget is going to look like. We have the budget that was just about done and it's now been shelved for a couple of months. So we really have no money to work with. And I appreciate that uh, Councillor Cleary is saying these should be inexpensive. Um, Zero cost is is the best form of inexpensive when we don't know how much money we're going to have to work with, but that is obviously not going to be the reality. I would also generally look for things that are far longer term. I would look for things that are, uh, if we're going to implement a measure, my, my preference would be to implement a permanent measure, not a temporary measure, but I get that this will live through the uh, course of the virus, and, and so I'm, I'm concerned about that um, because we're going to have to spend money to design it and to implement it and to roll it back uh, at the time that things are lifted. And we just, we're back to, we don't know how much uh, we are going to have available. I'm simply extremely concerned that, uh, that we might not be able to do this in a timely manner, in a budget friendly manner. I, I get where Councillor Cleary is going with this. Um, I, I get that having the ability for residents to be able to get out by walking or by uh, bike riding uh, would be fantastic. And I'd like I'd like to see more of that in streets across HRM, including out here in Sackville. Um, at this point, we are limited to biking on the streets and walking on the sidewalks where, as has been pointed out, we can't uh, have the uh, six foot uh, social distancing on the sidewalks. Somebody has to go on the street. So this sounds like it makes sense. I'm simply concerned that this is not the right time because we don't know what the budget is and I don't like it being a, uh, a temporary measure. I'm still on the fence about it. I'm not sure where I'm going to go, but I'm, I'm not terribly comfortable with it at this point. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mayor. So so for me, I, I go back to some of the comments from Councillor Austin. Uh, I look at it as the recovery aspect of what we're going to do to, you know, I think we're in COVID uh, situation for a long time. So, and I, I know Councillor Austin can sympathize when you think about kids. We'd love to stay in the host as long as we could and do work and answer emails and phone calls, but sometimes kids need to go for walks uh, and get outside for them for some for some fresh air. So you know, for me and my daughter, when we go out for a stroll or a scooter ride or a bike ride, we we try our best to adhere to all the social distancing distancing uh, rules. And and it's it's difficult because of our sidewalks. And sometimes I stay in the street the whole time just so she has a, a spot to go. Uh, so I I sympathize with the residents who who see this as an issue. And I do also understand that we do have resources. Um, and lack there of resources to to implement this in a timely manner, but other cities have done it. So hopefully we can, but I, I look at this as more as the recovery aspect and maybe not the immediate understanding kind of the the place that we're today. So the two the two questions that I have is one just for Jacques understanding the team or the task force, whatever it's being called, how implementation works. So do will there need to be some kind of council direction or will we go right to the traffic authority to to implement anything or even our transportation folks so how does that work and maybe that's something that could just be addressed in the staff report you don't need to answer now i'm just curious what that means because i never heard about the task force either and that's why as councillor also said communication is important because uh, if, if i think even folks knowing that we have uh, a team working on it would have been some some uh some help as well and also uh, you spoke, uh, Jacques, on cities seeing regret. If you can just expand or, or even if it's in the report or even send us information on where you've seen this, because that'd be and that would be good for information for 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 me, because I haven't I haven't saw that, but I, I'm not saying it, it's not out there. So I'd be interested in understanding some of those cities who've done this, why they've had some regrets. So two questions is how the how the task force will implement and then the the comment on the regret. 
Jacques, you good there? Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the task force is comprised of uh, folks out of uh, out of uh, planning and development and, and transportation and public works. So, you know, the their work is is looking at all of the all of the um, measures we need to take as the economy starts to um, starts to reopen from a transportation perspective, right? So. What are some of the things that we need to implement uh, soon, like next week, next month, uh, two months from now, et cetera? So, we, you know, the plan going forward, we, you know, we're, we're, all we're asking you to do is to allow the task force to do its work and start implementing right? And we'll keep council informed as we move forward. Um, so the work that's being contemplated by, um, by this motion or intended by the motion is something that these things are going to happen at some, at some level, right? So it's a question of, uh, making sure we have a plan, making sure we start implementing these on a timely basis based on the direction we're getting from Dr. Strang and his folks, right? So as we, as, as we, we know, we don't know what's going to open yet, where they're going to be. So we could put in measures in a certain neighborhood that, that, are, that, that, are, that, is not, that are not useful, right? That are not useful in terms of the recovery. So we've got to make sure we address measures, mash up measures to the recovery plans that are being implemented or imposed by the province, right? So this has got to be thoughtful and it has to be succinct and it has to be done effectively. Uh, the timing of it all, um, you know, as I mentioned, it's going to be staged. It will be a staged event. It will be staged measures going forward, whether it's um, you know, crosswalks, bike lanes, uh, whatever, whatever have you, signalization, those kinds of things. In terms of seeing what other cities are doing and what uh, and what uh, some of those who may have regretted uh, some of the measures they took early, uh, I can certainly have Brad provide you with a, a note on that. Uh, Brad Wanguish is is in, is is in constant contact as with, as are most of all our business direct and business unit directors with their counterparts across the country and are get are, are getting feedback from those municipalities uh, on a go on an ongoing basis what they're doing and we're trying to trying to identify best practices and come up with a made in Halifax solution for what we're going to do uh, that's, that meets our specific needs. We are not the city of Toronto. We don't have the same level of, of, um, of activity or people, uh, but again, they're taking some measures that works for them and we're going to take measures that works for us based on our specific circumstance. So I'll so, certainly so get that information to you. So really quickly then, so the information, would it come to us or would it be in the staff report? It would go to you uh, and right now where the information in relation to what other cities are doing, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll get that to you within the, within the next few days. OK, that won't be that won't be part of the staff report. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Councillor Hensby. Well, hey, Mr. Mayor, and I had some reservations about this motion because I don't like temporary, I like more permanent solutions. Uh, as as uh, our CAO talked about the AAA network, we got this federal and provincial money for. I'd love to see that implemented. I'd like to see where our, where we have the missing links in our network. Let's fix those little problems first so we have better connectivity. Uh, I'm, I'm fearful that if we start opening some streets up for pedestrian and cycling, this is sort of like the switch program where we close this, the street for a weekend and then we get a congregation of people showing up. So I'm kind of fearful that if we start doing this in an even temporary measure, People are going to flock to these so-called expanded areas for, for walking and cycling. Uh, I'd rather see something more permanent. Let's get on with the AAA network and move forward with that. Uh, you know, the, uh, another simple thing to do if we're having troubles with the amount of space on sidewalks, we may have to move on on-street parking uh, limitations in certain areas. Get the parked cars out of the way, so therefore Councillor Smith can jaywalk easily on the streets. Uh, that way, would give room for his daughter on the sidewalk. But I'm concerned, though, is that uh, if we start doing this temporarily, I have, a, I have a feeling it's going to probably backfire. I'd rather see more permanent solutions for an integrated uh, active transportation network and, and let's get on with that instead of doing these half step measures. Thank you. Councillor Stretch. Thank you very much, Your Worship. You know, uh, uh, you really need to listen to what Jock's saying to you here today. I have never been one to send somebody on a fool's errand. And I think that uh, we're teetering on that uh, right now, even by venturing. And I appreciate, uh, uh, Councillor Cleary, where you're coming from. I appreciate the comments and support. 
but uh, you could be setting us up for uh, uh, an outcome that is not what is intended. Uh, I, I don't think I can support this. I mean, a lot of times uh, we will, in a gratuitous uh, way, uh, say, let's uh, send it for a report. I know that there are people that are concerned. I'm hearing the same things. People are getting frustrated. They need to get out. But to take uh, an action like this, even just to take the step of putting the report uh, in place, not only is it going to tax your staff, who right now, I believe, are uh, uh, doing the best they can under very uh, challenging circumstances, it is going to take attention and focus away from the uh, actions that really need to be dealt with. And we have a lot bigger fish to fry than uh, changing roads to allow bicycles and people to walk down the center of them. As it relates to uh, cars, absolutely. Uh, cars and trucks, uh, once the economy starts opening up and people are traveling, that is how they're going to be traveling. I guarantee you, I won't be taking a bicycle in from Middle Musket Abbott to get uh, to City Hall. I'll be keep staying in my truck and, and maybe not even want to get out of it. So uh, all rhetoric aside and, and appreciating where the councillor is coming from, I think uh, we need to nip this in the butt uh, right now. You have a plan that uh, we, we have been working on. It will continue when uh, this passes but uh, you've got to prioritize uh, your actions and the challenges that you give your staff. And I think this would be taking you in the wrong direction. Thank you. Okay, let me just see who... Uh... Councillor Whitman, did you want to speak again? Uh, yes, please. Thank you, Mayor Savage. Go ahead. So I think, uh, thank you. Um, I'm convinced that as elected officials, we need to think about residents' priorities, not our own personal needs, wants, and projects. I've had zero correspondence looking for temporary bike lanes. I've had hundreds of calls and emails and correspondence regarding a lot of other priorities of residents, and this isn't one of them. This is a bad use of money that we just don't have. The, uh, the CAO mentioned that the expedited staff report wouldn't come back until the end of the year, as in snowy time of year, and uh, it's money that we don't have for a project that's not a priority. Also, the CAO told us that this motion potentially could jeopardize any progress that we're currently making for cyclists and pedestrians. We already have staff working hard coming up with solutions. Staff are already being paid to work on this and this temporary measure should jump in front of it. I don't think so. Um, it seems that we're out of touch even prioritizing this on today's agenda when we have so many other issues that we should be talking about. And uh, hospitals right now are canceling elective surgeries. This is elective. This is not essential, and I won't be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mason? Sure, thank you. Uh, I don't have any uh, beautifully crafted words like that, but I'll do the best I can. So 25% of the population, I'll say to Councillor Stretch, lives in the regional centre. Uh, in my district, I have census areas where 10 to 20 percent of the population bikes to work. So uh, we don't just like rural needs different solutions from urban. Urban needs different solutions from uh, rural and suburban. So we're talking about, uh, you know, about 125,000 people who are impacted by the pedestrianization and the and the cycling. Uh, and I want to point out to uh, council that we have staff in TPW whose job it is to do tactical work. That's their job. That's what mm -hmm. those uh, those uh, uh, bump outs and and uh, at the sidewalks under Agricola Street are. We, we're doing these things around HRM. So yeah, maybe in this case, in support of COVID, we take those staff whose job it is to do tactical stuff and we pull them off of whatever bump out was requested and being explored and we put them on this because we need it for for covid so uh you know we can say that this isn't uh, that this is elective and not something that we need to do right now but the whole point is even if it's going to take a month or three for us to plan it and sync it up with the next phase of this 18 month to two year covid thing uh we need to be making these decisions now so we can get in front of these problems so that we're actually ready for what our residents are going to need when we get there so certainly what i've heard from hundreds of my residents since i represent a place where people actually bike and walk to work is that they want to see these changes and, and I'm going to support it because that's what I'm hearing from my residents. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. I'm just looking at the chat. I think I've got everybody who's wanted to speak. Is there anybody else that wants to speak to this before we go to a vote? I'd like to speak again, uh, Your Worship. Councillor Cleary. Thank you. Um, wow, our, 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 cult, our car culture is on full display here at Council. 
Um, I, I can't think of a time in the last year and a half since our former traffic authority and, and director of TPW left that I've missed Bruce Vonnegut more than I have today. Um, to Mr. Dubay's point about recreating, uh, this isn't about recreation, this is about transportation. And to the councillors, they say they're going to be driving around. Unfortunately, not everyone has an F uh, F-150 to drive around in. Some people do have to actually walk or cycle. Um, on Quinpool Road alone, uh, half the businesses are still open. We've got a hardware store, an NSLC, a couple of grocery stores, uh, restaurants that are doing curbside pickup and delivery, bike shop. These are all essential services that are open for people and people have to get to them. I'm actually completely shocked and appalled in the truest uh, Alexa McDonough fashion at Mr. Dubay's response that this would take several months. Um, Mexico City, Perth, Sydney, Calgary, Budapest, Bogota, Berlin, Philadelphia, London, Vancouver, Minneapolis, Milan, New York, Boston, New Zealand is actually funding all of their cities to do this right now. Are these cities somehow less busy than Halifax? We're so busy as a city, we can't do what virtually every other city has done. One of my favorite cities, and this actually, this city has a, I was born in this city and I live just down the street from this. Hard to see, um, oh, my computer will come on the screen. Um, if you look at the uh, Toronto Star, there's a picture of beautiful Brampton, Ontario, looking up Vauden Street. And it's a temporary installation with just its pylons and some signs. Um, this isn't gold plated. This, this is, and they actually have it on their website, the COVID-19 Bike Network. Uh, and don't forget, this city is run by Patrick Brown, former PC Ontario leader. Uh, you, you don't get much more conservative than that. Uh, and he's instructed his TPW staff to install these bike uh, networks and sidewalks. Uh, and, and they've all done it. Uh, I sent an email, because uh, several councillors were talking about this. I sent an email on April the 5th to TPW. Melanie uh, Campbell, of course, as our system requires, we send everything through Mel. Mel sent it back a week later, just under a week later, I get the response back from uh, uh, Director Anguish uh, saying, nah, we can't do it. Um, it's now April the 28th. Uh, cities all around the world have done this and I haven't read, I'd be interested to see what Mr. Dubay's report comes in. I haven't read any city that said they've regretted creating more space for pedestrians to not get COVID from each other. So I'm, I'm disheartened at the kind of comments um, uh, that, I've, that I've heard um, even the ones written by girlfriends of councillors that they read on, on here, uh, you know, I haven't heard anything that's said to me that this is a bad thing to do for our residents. So um, I hope people will support this and I hope uh, that it doesn't take six months. That's appalling that uh, other cities have done this already. And our, our CAO says uh, it takes us six months to think about where we would put some pylons. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave my thoughts there for right now. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, Tim, are you, uh, Councillor Arthur, are you looking to speak again? I'm not sure what this yeah, is. Yeah, I wouldn't mind. I, I, thank you, Mayor. And uh, sorry, I had to move and plug in here. I didn't want you to lose me. Um, I'd like to pull Jacques back in for a moment here because what I'm hearing is we still have this middle ground. I think, you know, I, I, I agree with everything that, that Jacques has said. I agree with uh, us being. Um, setting priorities, launches of stop time, costs, etc. Then I'm hearing uh, Sean's frustration uh, that I mentioned too, it can't take six months to do a report to prepare for some of these sorts of things. But what I heard from Jacques, and where, and where I, I guess I disagree with Matt a little bit on this, is that I don't think we're wasting time and money and whatnot. I'm hearing that some of this is already underway anyway. So I, I would really like, I don't know if uh, Jacques can jump in and do this or Brad's there, but somebody please tell me uh, once more to make it clear here that some of what Sean has brought forward is already underway because we know we are going to open. We are know we are going to have to have restrictions. We know there's going to be social distancing. We know people on the production of bike coming out. So, you know, I, I just don't think we're the miles, of, I just don't think we're the miles apart the debate would indicate we might be. So is, is Jacques or Brad able to jump in again? Yeah, I'm, I'm here, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I don't think Brad's on the line. This is a request for a okay. staff report. We don't bring staff in until uh, we report back. Uh, Jacques, go ahead if you wish. Sure, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, look, first of all, uh, you know, it, it would be helpful if we had a respectful conversation. And uh, you know, the what I said earlier was that 
we are implementing certain measures. You know, we put in some of the timing around the crosswalks already. We're looking at, uh, we're, we're going out and about studying all this. You know, we can spend some time writing up a staff report if you wish and not do that, or we can take the time and start and start adjusting our, our approaches as I as I indicated already, not only in a memo, but on in, in this conversation. So, you know, we're going to move on these on these matters, to the extent of which I can't describe today because it's a moving target. Uh, we're going to we're going to look at what Dr. Strang orders us to do, and we're going to look at a very specific intersections when we know there's a business that's going to open that has a lot of people in it and we'll adjust accordingly. In the meantime, we'll continue with our planning and continue with our implement implementation. So, you know, qu quite frankly, I don't think we need a staff report. Uh, well, Council, that's Council's purview. If you wish to have a staff report, we'll produce one. Uh, it'll take some time uh, because it's, you know, like any other staff report, uh, we have to multi-stakeholder, multi, you know, multi-business unit consultations and all that to get back with a report. Uh, and that report, frankly, may well basically confirm what we've already done uh, in, in, in certain areas of the city. So we're not looking at a blanket approach. We're looking at a very much a very surgical approach to this, depending on how the economy gets opened up again and what actually happens and what we can do to accommodate the various users of the various transportation modes that we have uh, in, in play in Halifax. Right? Point of order, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. Mr. Mayor it's, it's Councillor Cleary here. Point of order uh, on the rules here. Um, so Mr. DeBay just indicated we don't need a staff report, but we're constantly reminded, and it says in the charter that we require the advice of our CIO, which almost always manifests as a staff report. If he's telling us today that we don't need a staff report, that his advice today is that he can go and do this, then I, I need some clarification on what our rules actually say. No, I don't think that he's saying he's going to go ahead and, and do this. I do want to just ask councillors that let's not question the motivations of other councillors and let's not make personal comments. Let's just have a conversation based on this topic. Make your points. I think we're dragging more and more councillors back into this who feel like they need to respond in some way. So let's just be respectful. Uh, Mike, can I just, Mayor, can I just finish? Sorry, uh, Jacques. I, I Jacques responded to my question, and I and Sean made a Councillor point. Councillor Outhead, okay, yeah. Uh, so what I guess what I'd like Jacques to say is, I mean, council can request a staff report. We can also give the CIO direction, and it sounds to me like the CIO, regardless of whether direction came from us or not, is looking at a number of the things with his with his team that Sean is mentioning, in which I support. So can we just get a quick yes or no? Is a lot of what Sean is looking for as we open up, are the team presently looking at this? Ways to increase uh, bike lanes, walking, distancing on sidewalks, this sort of thing. If they're looking on these sorts of things, then I'll take comfort in that. Jacques, I, I, uh, what I heard was that Councillor Cleary had gone through Mel to to uh, to Brad Anguish and get an answer no, that they weren't going to do it. That's what I understood. Right. And <clears throat> since that time, as I mentioned, and that was like what it was that I think Councillor Cleary mentioned that was a month ago or something. You know, that's just reflective of how this situation is rapidly changing. So we're going to look at all all options and all solutions and we'll start implementing solutions as we deem them appropriate from a transportation uh, mode and transportation planning uh, uh, movement of people and and and, uh, and vehicles uh, throughout the city. So, you know, we're not going to we are not going to go out and start creating temporary bike lanes where we don't need them. Um, but based on based on needs and based on on, on evidence uh, and based on the reality of, of the reopening of the economy, we'll adjust accordingly. So it'll be a it'll be a, a very much a surgical approach to this, a big bit, you know, subject to the circumstances we find on the ground and what orders we get from the province. Okay. Thank you. We have a few more speakers, Councillor. Uh, Adams. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. And I wasn't going to get involved in this. Um, however, what I'm hearing from um, Mr. Dubé is that uh, a report probably isn't ne necessary because our staff is going to look for opportunities anyway. The other thing is in, in checking with Stats Can, and 1.14% uh, of HRM's population uses a bicycle to go to work, that works out to 2,480 people. Um, not saying that they're not important, 200, uh, 2480 people, but I think that if 
you know, if we're going to spend some money and we're going to look for extra stuff to do, that may not be the way to go. And 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 still, this is going to be uh, you know done to the best of uh, our staff's ability, given the circumstances, given the whole uh, coronavirus, and given all the other uh, moving parts here. I don't know if a, a staff report's well advised because, in fact, that may, if we ask for a staff report, that may hold in abeyance any of the work that's being done that could help accommodate some of the bicycling and pedestrians. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Zorowski. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I I can understand why Councillor Cleary is frustrated. I'm, I'm getting a bit frustrated as well. And... Um, there seems to be a polarization that I don't think is really necessary. This is an opportunity, as I stated previously, um, to bring the bicycle into the mainstream here. And the fact that um, StatsCan may give us 2,100 or 2,400 people using bicycles, the fact that we don't have lanes out there right now is an issue and prohibits a lot of people like me who would like to get out there but have no real interest in becoming a hood ornament. As far as what um, Dr. Strang has to say, um, we already have uh, one meter distance between cars and bicycles. So I, I, I don't think the COVID virus is really that much of an issue um, in terms of moving pl people from one place to another. And it's definitely not a recreation for most people. And I am hearing, I'm not in the core of the city, I am in the suburbs of HRM, I am hearing from many interested residents that they would like to see an improvement to the cycle situation. I think this is a perfect opportunity to do it. And I, I would like to see it expedited as quickly as possible. I, there must be a way to do this. Thank you. I will be voting for this. Thank you. Councillor Stretch. Okay, Your Worship, uh, we'd like to should wrap this up, and I didn't mean to hurt anybody's feelings. I mean, uh, uh, that's not who I am, and it's not what I'm about, but I am entitled to my opinion. And uh, Jacques, uh, you're, ab you're absolutely right. Uh, a respectful conversation and uh, uh, handling ourselves accordingly is the way we should be having this debate. But it's obvious we're all frustrated. People are, uh, are having a real difficult time, and I understand the uh, pressure that's coming. Uh, but there's no need to apologize, Jacques. You're giving us the best uh, advice that uh, that you can. And to Councillor Cleary and to Councillor uh, uh, Mason, uh, to me, this isn't about uh, rural, suburban or urban. It's about priorities. And uh, just for clarification, uh, it's an F-350 Super Duty, not an F-150. Thank you. Okay. I think that gives us the clarity we need to perhaps go to a vote. Is there anybody else that wishes to uh, speak on this? Question. Cheryl, let's call the roll. Councillor Stretch. Against the motion. Councillor Hensby. Against the motion. Councillor Karsten. Against the motion. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Mancini. Uh, yes. Councillor Mason. Councillor Mason. For the motion. Councillor Smith. For the motion. Councillor Cleary. Uh, yes. Councillor Walker. For. Councillor Adams. Against. Councillor Sarowski. For the motion. Councillor Whitman. Against the motion. Deputy Mayor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outhit. For the motion. And, De and Mayor Savage. For the motion. So that's 12. 12 in favor and five against. 12 in favor, five against. The motion is carried. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. We'll go to, uh, uh, we have one more item before we move in camera. So let's, uh, let's do 7.2.4 colleagues. This is Councillor Nickel, Public Transit Emergency Funding. Councillor Nickel. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will put the motion on the floor for council to consider and hopefully will support because I, this one, I do believe we are all in agreement that regional council make a statement supporting the Canadian Urban Transit Association, CUDA, request to the federal government for emergency funding due to COVID-19 expenses as follows. One, $400 million a month in revenue relief to keep services running as fare box and other revenue drops by up to 100%. Two, a fund to help systems maintain liquidity in the period before revenue relief can arrive. CUDA estimates as many as 40% of systems may require bridge funding over the coming months. The association hopes these systems can access $1.2 billion to help them keep the buses and trains running. Three, support to cover costs of disinfectants and protective equipment for employees. Second, I would second that, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Bill Carston, go ahead, uh, Councillor Nicol. Thank you, Councillor Carston. And as we, when I'll read the reason as ridership plummets and cleaning costs to protect passengers and employees soar, the public transit sector is seeking immediate federal relief to get essential workers to work and help people do things between transit operators and passengers for their essential day to day life. Many systems are foregoing fare collection altogether. Another growing issue is the availability of disinfectants and protective equipment for employees. Consultations with CUDA members, as you know, I am a member uh, for council, have revealed that more than 70% reported difficulty securing cleaning supplies and protective gear. It's also seeking federal support to cover these costs and CUDA is also asking that transit be added to the priority list of sectors receiving these products in the event their supply is restricted as an emergency. And there was a line missing in the outcome sought. So it's basically ask a regional council for the statement to support CUDA's request for federal government emergency funding and that a copy of this statement be sent to the Prime Minister of Canada and the Minister or the fin Minister of Finance of Canada as well. So it's not just the statement is to be, has a destiny and where we want to. And I, I want to applaud the efforts of the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities and our president, Bill Carson, with the FCM. So this is basically a collective approach. I think all of us have said the same thing that um, we, you know, the prime minister has said he is going to help. We have, we don't know what that help might look like. So the more voices from the, the, the politicians around Canada that are wanting to this essential service, um, I guess reimbursed for everything that we've, all the monies that we've lost on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm sure council is supportive of CUDA's pres you know, position in this. And um, oh, didn't hear, I heard a sigh. I guess I'm done. Okay, you finished? Yes, I am. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Carsten on this. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Nickel, for bringing this forward on behalf of CUDA. Um, and you are 100% correct in what you just said in terms of the more voices uh, that are, are loud and bring this message forward to the federal government, uh, the more voices, the better. This is time for uh, literally all hands to be on deck and uh, very pleased to not only second it, but also the report that uh, uh, FCM Federation of Canadian Municipalities do work on, on these type of advocacy things hand in glove uh, with CUDA. Uh, I know that we were speaking to them just uh, literally the end of last week. Uh, we support their recommendation and they have uh, very strongly a few weeks ago actually uh, supported the, the FCM position. So this is a great opportunity to say yes. Uh, we are hemorrhaging as a nation uh, $400 million uh, of trans revenue uh, that is not uh, recoupable. We, these are unrecoverable uh, losses. And quite frankly, it's more than a financial crunch. Uh, I think uh, our CFO and, and uh, Jacques Debay would totally agree that this is a threat to vital services that we, we uh, deliver for our municipalities. You know, we, we know that the number for Halifax is 3 million uh, and, and it doesn't end there. You know, I just want to piggyback Councillor Nickel on this uh, to take the opportunity to say as important as the losses for transit are, there's much, much more to this 
on, on a big picture basis because in reality, uh, you know, the the user fees and uh, uh, the amounts of money that's deferred from, uh, uh, that we're losing from deferred property tax, utility charges for some municipality, and as I say, the user fees. Uh, we have come out as FCM just last week in a press uh, conference that we're actually bundling the uh, $2.4 billion for municipalities uh, that we're asking for, which is still $400 a month, but the formula is a little different how CUTA does it and, and the advocacy that FCM does, but it boils down to the very same thing. Uh, we're piggybacking on that and saying transit uh, revenue losses are incredibly important, but when you stop and think there's two more elements, there's some municipalities that don't have transit that are also losing an incredible amount of money uh, in, in other ways of lost revenue. And number two, uh, the uh, fact that uh, the municipalities that do have transit, including us, are losing so, so much more revenue on top of just simply transit. So our ask last week uh, was a minimum of $10 billion, uh, and that was based on $7.6 billion in direct allocation, sort of like the gas tax fund that we're all used to, and then the allocated uh, uh, 2.4 billion uh, for municipalities with transit systems. So thank you for bringing it forward. Let's have that discussion uh, in, in our region as well uh, to make sure that all members of parliament, literally all members of parliament in this province are aware of the dire state the municipalities in. And, and Mr. Mayor, I know my time must be pretty much up. I don't have a clock, but I have to piggyback this as well and say, that I'm so, so proud, Mr. Mayor, and you know this as well, to big city mayor's caucus, et cetera, that the very first thing that municipal leaders across the country were asking for uh, was not thinking immediately of themselves, but making sure we look after a vulnerable population for, but this alarm now has been run for many, many weeks. It's time we have attention from our federal league. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Karsten. And, uh should thank you. you. You've been very busy on this uh, nationally, not just the transit uh, piece. And if I could just say that a, a week or so ago, we had one of our calls with Deputy Minister, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Freeland, um, and I, I, I asked the question on the transit piece in terms of explaining why it's so important to us, the, what we've heard here. Certainly, she seemed to understand that. Just one thing, uh, Councillor Karsten, you mentioned the cost to the Halifax is three million. Uh, that's three million a month for anybody who's listening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About a total of three million a month plus, yeah. and um, it, and it is a, it's been deemed an essential service. So it's you know it's it, we're following the provincial order on that. All right, any uh, questions, Councillor, on this one, Councillor Whitman, or is that the last yeah. one? Uh, on Council the transit, Councillor Whitman. Uh, thank you, Mayor Savage, and uh, thank you, Councillor Karsten and uh, Nickel on this file. Um, Councillor Carson uh, alluded to uh, a, a question that I've had about what funding is going to be available, and perhaps we don't know, but the number was $3 million monthly is the fare box revenue loss. And is this uh, funding, if we know, mainly uh, regarding fare box loss, or is it also can, um, uh, potentially useful for some of the larger number, the 70% number of the, uh, the general tax revenue piece? Do we qualify for that, or is the maximum that we could qualify just the three million uh, fare box revenue? Well, let me. So, this is just on the transit piece. Right. There's an there's an ask of seven point six million billion, which is which could be used by municipalities um, to offset operating losses that would come from things like potential tax deferrals. Uh, this is specifically the, what it would take just on the transit piece alone, the two point four uh, billion. Right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So my question is, is that on the transit piece, the piece that we are um, trying to uh, collect on is recouping the three million dollars a month that we're losing on transit? Or can we try to recoup some of the other seven million dollars or more a month that we're losing through the general uh, tax rate on transit? I'm not sure I get that. Councillor Nicol so, or Jacques, Jacques do, you, do you follow that? Oh, do you mean like over and above COVID, Councillor Whitman? 
Yeah, so transit costs over $100 million a year to run. Right. We're currently losing $3 million a month. The missing number, can that number be uh, made up from this fund or just the $3 million a month? This would be COVID-related costs to the municipality. So it would Lost. be the fare box lost revenue, but it would also be cleaning and disinfecting and other things that we might need uh, as part of it. But it wouldn't be to make up for overall transit. The federal government funds transit through the Public Transit Infrastructure Fund, and we've certainly taken advantage of that over the last uh, four to five years, and particularly over the last three. But this would be COVID-related. Yeah, fair box. Thank you. Yeah. But other costs, too. That it speaks specifically to things like... Uh, disinfectants what, and PPE and things like that. That's what the okay. motion reads. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yep. Thank you for answering my question, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, guys. Uh, ready for the question, colleagues? No. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Karsten? Councillor Karsten. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I would just add that uh, certainly numbers can get uh, complicated to some degree. This was actually released uh, to all members of council uh, from the FCM last week in regards to a 10-page really comprehensive document uh, called the uh, Protecting Vital Municipal Services document. So that should be in their inbox at some point or in somewhere in their inbox or filed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, Councillor Nicol, you're good? I am. It's been clarified. Call thank the you. question. Ready for the question, uh, Cheryl? Question. You muted. Councillor Stretch. For the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Karsten. Spread the word that I'm for the motion. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Nickel. Yes. I knew that. <laughs> Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Mancini. Yes. Councillor Mason. For the motion. Councillor Smith. Support the motion. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walker. For. Councillor Adams. For. Councillor Sarowski? For. Councillor Whitman? I'm in favor. Councillor Blackburn? Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell? For the motion. Councillor Outit? Yes. And Mayor Savage? For the motion. I think that's unanimous. That passes. Thank you, Councillor Nickel. Colleagues, I want to just have a look. Uh, we're going to. Probably need to go in camera, but is there any items that anybody wishes to uh, consider doing without going into uh, camera? Have you had a look at the items? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I would do 8.2. Uh, 8 go ahead, test council. I'll try, I'll try council on 8.2 and Mr. Mayor, it's uh, uh, screen just came up that we're in camera, but we're not at this point, correct? So for yeah, folks at home. Camera. Is that uh, something they're seeing at home or? Yes, yeah. they are seeing that. Yeah. Can we uh, get one we're of our intrepid producers? To... Or Simon, sorry. Anyway, we're still in uh, in, in public. I think so we're I good. There we yeah, go. We're good. Um, that uh, 8.2 Personnel Matters Citizen Council Appointments to Boards and Committees in keeping with the public appointment policy adopted by Council in August 2011 to be found at uh, Halifax.ca. Uh, yeah, I so move. Oh no, I'm sorry. I read the preamble that Halifax Regional Council one adopt the recommendation. Uh, recommendations as outlined in private confidential report dated April 15, 2000 and 20 and two not released the private and confidential report in April 15th, 2020 to the public. I so move. Second by Mancini. Seconded by Councillor Mancini. Ready for the question, uh, colleagues? Question. Question. Councillor Stretch. In favor. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. 
Councillor Karsten. Yes. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Mancini. Uh, yes. Councillor Mason. Yes. Councillor Smith. Yes. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walker. Or. Councillor Adams. Or. Councillor Sereski. In favor. Councillor Whitman. In favor. Deputy Mayor Blackburn. Voting in favor, yes. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outit. Voting yes. And Mayor Savage. I'm for the motion, so 8.2 passes. Thank you, Councillor uh, Karsten. Um, Councillor Nicol, did you wish to, I see your hand, did you wish to move one? Yes, if Council will allow 8.3 for consideration, I will just move the on the put it on the floor that Halifax Regional Council adopt the recommendations as outlined in the private and confidential report dated April 15, 2020, and to not release the private and confidential report dated April 15, 2020 to the public. Second. Seconded by the Deputy Mayor. Any discussion on that? Question. Let's do, let's do the question. Councillor Stretch. For the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Karsten. Yes. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Mancini. Uh, yes. Councillor Mason. Councillor Mason. Hello, is that working? Yep. Yes. That would be a yes. Councillor Smith. Yes. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walker. Or. Councillor Adams. Or. Councillor Sarowski. In favor. Councillor Whitman. Yes. Deputy Mayor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outhead. Voting yes. And Mayor Savage. I'll vote for that. Uh, that was passed, I think. Uh, Cheryl? Yes, you did. Thank you. House Deputy Mayor, you're looking at one. Yes, I'd like to uh, uh, move 8.4, move that uh, Halifax Regional Council 1. Adopt the recommendations as outlined in the private and confidential report dated April 15, 2020, and two, not release the private and confidential report dated April 15, 2020 to the public. I so move. Seconded. Second. Councillor Walker. Seconded by Councillor Walker. Ready for the question, colleagues? Question. Question. Councillor Stretch. Voting in favor. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Karsten. Yes. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Mancini. Yes. Councillor Mason. For the motion. Councillor Smith. Yes. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walker. Or. Councillor Adams. Or. Councillor Sarowski. Yes. Councillor Whitman. I'm opposed. Deputy Mayor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. I'm sorry, Councillor Russell, I didn't quite catch that. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Outhead. Yes. Councillor, no, Mayor Savage. Four. That's uh, 16 to one. That's, That's passed, thank you. So that leaves us with one item in camera. I am going to assume that we want to go in camera on that item. Seeing nobody wanting to put it forward. Perhaps what I would do though is uh, do notices well, of motion. Well, Mr. Uh, Mayor. Yes. 
On 8.1, I don't think I can just ask for a supplementary report out of in camera on 8. No. Okay, then I guess I have to go can't in. discuss the matter. Yeah. Well, okay. before we go in camera, let me perhaps do notices of motion then for those who are watching at home and may not come back after the in camera. Uh, Councillor Walker, I think you have one. Yes, I do, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead. Take notice that the next meeting of Halifax Regional Council will be held on May 12th, 2020. I tend to move a new Administrative Order 2020-009-ADM respecting recommendations for the allocation of grants and withdrawal from reserves during COVID-19. The purpose of which is to shorten approval time to allocate funds and withdraw from reserves by temporarily suspending the need for council to achieve a recommendation from one, the grants committee or special events committee advisory committee before awarding a grant and two, the audit and finance standing committee on impacts to the reserves. Thank you. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Feels like deja vu. Uh, take notice that the next meeting of Regional Council to be held on May 12, 2020. I, I propose to introduce Administrative Order 2020 002 Gov, the Social Policy Administrative Order, the purpose of which is to provide a clearly defined, consistent, and collaborative approach to social policy. Thank you. Anybody else? If not, I'll accept a motion to uh, go in camera. So moved by Paul. Moved by Councillor Russell, seconded. Second. Councillor Nickel. Nickel. Okay, we're going to go. So colleagues, just to, for those of you on the line, we have to go out of this and come back, but let's just, should we take 10 minutes, 15 minutes? Yeah. I don't know that there's a whole lot left to do. Let's try to come back at uh, as close to 3.30 as possible and uh, wrap up uh, the agenda. Okay, so we'll, we'll come out of this meeting. We'll go back into the uh, in-camera um, uh, notification on your on your uh, agendas. Okay, thank you.
Anyone else back on yet? And we're back. I'm here. Here. We're here. I'm here. Anybody out there? Just yeah, I'm here, David. I can hear you, Steve. We're coming here. back in. We're coming in. We're also live, of course, people. Don't holler at your kids, Austin. Yeah, that can be debatable by some. <laughs> Simon, please remove the slide. Mike, Mr. Your Mary, Mr. Mike. Mary, you're on mute. Just to let you know, I was on mute there. And, uh, <laughs> Laura and Liam have been producing this, as I mentioned earlier, and I want to thank Laura and Liam, as I know we all do. If you think they did a good job, put a thumbs up on the screen for our wonderful, hardworking staff, please. Thank you. Awesome, guys. Um, we will go to item 8.1, Councillor Nickel. Councillor Nickel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll ask that Regional Council defer 8.1 according to the direction given in camera. Seconded. Seconded by Councillor David Hensby. Ready for the question, Cheryl? Councillor Stretch. For the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Karsten. Councillor Carson? He says he can't yes. get back. Oh, there he is. Okay. Yes. Councillor Nickel. Yes. yes. Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Mancini. Yes. Councillor Mason. For the motion. Councillor Smith. For the motion. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walker. For. Councillor Adams. I think you have to leave. Okay, Councillor Sarowski. Yes. Councillor Whitman. In favor. Deputy Mayor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outfit? Yes. And Mayor Savage? For the motion. The motion uh, carries. Colleagues, before we uh, uh, adjourn, I wanted to just thank a couple of folks. Patrick Sullivan from the Chamber of Commerce and his group who've been doing some strong work and particularly want to thank Patrick for um, the Chamber of Commerce and the largest chambers of commerce in Canada, of which he is one, in writing a letter of support of federal funding for municipalities. Uh, and I also want to thank Danny Cavanaugh from the Nova Scotia Federation of Labour, who indicated to us today that, or yesterday perhaps, that he's also written a letter on behalf of uh, some labour uh, groups supporting municipalities and ensuring that we don't have to lay off uh, staff. So to all those who are supporting uh, municipalities as we uh, look to deal with this in the most effective way possible. Thanks for your support. Thanks to all the frontline workers, everybody who's working in the grocery stores and the pharmacies, who's working at the banks, um, who's working in restaurants. Um, as Councillor Cleary said earlier, the people who are around the world who we continue to rely on, this is a worldwide pandemic. To everybody who's making a difference, thank you. And uh, let's all keep the RCMP in our thoughts uh, and the great work that they're doing in the wake of the horrendous uh, crime that took place um, in Nova Scotia a week ago, Sunday. For the victims of the families, Deputy Mayor says it all, Nova Scotia strong. Uh, all the best. We'll come back, but it's, it hurts. Thank you all very much. Our next meeting is not next week, but the week after that, and we also begin a series of budget meetings. Thank you all very much. Motion to adjourn.
Thank you.